On Boxing Day in 1996, Linda Lunsford was expected to collect her daughters after finishing her work shift, but fate had other plans. Shortly after clocking out that morning, Linda mysteriously disappeared, leaving no trace behind. As the investigation unfolded, authorities turned their attention to an individual close to her, the last person known to have seen her alive. Yet, mere suspicion was insufficient. They required concrete evidence to unravel this enigma. Tragically, it would take a quarter of a century for Linda's family to finally obtain the proof necessary to bring the perpetrator to justice. On December 25, 1996, the 38-year-old mother of five was diligently working her evening shift at Walmart, located in the Village Marketplace Shopping Center in Chesterfield County, Virginia. She was focused on ensuring the store was impeccably prepared for the anticipated post-Christmas clearance sales. At 8.30 a.m. after completing their shift, Linda and her colleague, John Howard, decided to enjoy breakfast at a nearby fast food establishment. Their relationship had been a tumultuous one, marked by an on-and-off dynamic that had begun six months prior, culminating in Linda's decision to end things. Despite their breakup, Linda had formed a bond with John's children, prompting her desire to maintain a cordial relationship. Given their shared workplace, she was keen to avoid any potential awkwardness. After their meal, Linda was meant to visit her mother's home to pick up her three daughters, but she never made it. As time passed, anxiety grew among her loved ones. Her mother pondered the possible whereabouts of her daughter, who was known for her meticulous scheduling, a necessity given her commitment to three jobs to provide for her children. A delay in her plans would disrupt her entire day. When family members ventured out to search for Linda, they stumbled upon a troubling sight. Her 1994 Burgundy Nissan Sentra parked outside the Food Lion store in the village marketplace. The vehicle was secured, and Linda was nowhere to be found. Despite the absence of any indications of a struggle within the car, her family remained deeply troubled. That evening, they reported her missing to the Chesterfield police, urging the authorities to act swiftly, emphasizing that this behavior was utterly uncharacteristic of the devoted mother. Investigators reviewed the CCTV footage from Linda's workplace, concluding that she had departed voluntarily. Their attention then shifted to John Howard, the last individual known to have been in her company that day. He was summoned for questioning and acknowledged having breakfast with Linda that morning. However, John's children provided a conflicting account during their interviews, stating they had seen Linda at their home earlier that day, contradicting their father's narrative. When confronted with this discrepancy, John conveniently altered his story, claiming that Linda had visited him to discuss their relationship, expressing a desire to rekindle their romance, a sentiment Linda did not reciprocate. John maintained that she had left his residence that morning in good health, the investigators grew suspicious of John's honesty. With no other significant leads emerging, they concentrated their efforts on him. A review of his recent purchases prior to Linda's disappearance revealed that he had acquired a trash can, lighter fluid, and duct tape. While each item could potentially have an innocent explanation, the context raised concerns. Believing him to be their primary suspect, the Chesterfield police sought a search warrant to inspect his home. Upon its approval, they meticulously combed through every corner of John's property, searching for any evidence of wrongdoing. Ultimately, they found nothing new, except for the puzzling fact that John could not account for the whereabouts of the items he had purchased. Despite the absence of tangible evidence, the investigators pursuing Linda's case remained convinced that John was somehow involved in her mysterious disappearance. However, mere intuition holds no weight in a court of law. They required concrete proof. After exhausting every possible lead, they found themselves at a standstill, unable to connect him or anyone else to the troubling case. As months slipped by without any sightings of Linda, the investigation began to grow cold. In early May 2021, after years filled with dashed hopes and mounting frustration, the Chesterfield police announced a significant development in the Linda Lunsford case. 
After all this time, they finally believed they had amassed sufficient evidence to implicate 62-year-old John Howard in her disappearance. He was apprehended on May 17th, pleaded not guilty, and the trial commenced in August 2022. During the proceedings, prosecutors presented a video from an initial interview between a Chesterfield County police detective and Howard. In this interview, Howard described his relationship with Linda as intense, acknowledging that he had seen her the day after Christmas, yet claimed she left his residence alone and he never encountered her again. The trial unfolded over a week, culminating in the jury's verdict. They found John Howard guilty of the murder of Linda Lunsford, despite the fact that her body remained undiscovered. The specifics of the evidence leading to his conviction have not been disclosed to the public. Matt Barlow, who had worked alongside both Howard and Linda at Walmart during his college years, expressed hope that the conviction would provide some semblance of closure for their families. As a father, I can only imagine the anguish of a mother who vanishes while striving to support her children. What must their lives be like, he reflected. The thought of what transpired is undoubtedly traumatic and sorrowful. Barlow noted that while he never met Linda's children, she often spoke of them with great affection. It was clear she adored her kids, he remarked. I am genuinely saddened by what occurred. Barlow characterized Linda as warm-hearted and sociable, while he depicted Howard as reserved and pragmatic. I vividly recall the moment he returned to work and the unsettling news broke that Linda had vanished, with John emerging as a person of interest. The shock was palpable. What truly rattled us was the reality that one of our colleagues had simply disappeared. Even now, each time I step into that store, her memory lingers in my thoughts. Barlow recounted the swirling rumors during his tenure at Walmart regarding Linda's fate and speculations about Howard's involvement. At that time, Howard was in custody at Riverside Regional Jail, awaiting his sentencing. In November 2022, his attorney submitted a motion to overturn the August verdict, contending that the evidence was inadequate to establish that Linda Lunsford had died and that the circumstantial evidence failed to demonstrate Howard's culpability in her demise. A legal analyst from Eight News noted that the judge held a hearing on this matter and subsequently denied the defense's motion. Thus, the case stood at that juncture, yet an unexpected turn awaited. While in custody, Howard passed away on February 7, 2023, at Virginia Commonwealth University Medical Center, effectively closing the case against him. On February 2nd, court documents revealed that Howard's attorney had filed a motion to postpone sentencing, citing the defendant's health complications. Attorney Greg Sheldon disclosed that Howard had been undergoing cancer treatment throughout the proceedings. Consequently, a pre-sentence report and status hearing were scheduled in Chesterfield Circuit Court for February 21st, but Howard's untimely passing occurred before that date. According to Lakeisha Johnson from the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, the specifics surrounding Howard's cause and manner of death remain under investigation. The attorney representing him recently disclosed that he experienced a fall at Riverside Regional Jail, which, as reported by his daughter, resulted in a fractured orbital bone, multiple rib fractures, and two brain bleeds, necessitating two surgical procedures. For Linda's family, this revelation was utterly heartbreaking. Although they held no affection for Howard, his passing meant the loss of crucial information regarding the location of Linda's remains. A legal analyst remarked, In the absence of a body, the primary question becomes whether one can truly establish a cause of death. If that cannot be determined, it complicates the identification of the individual responsible for the act. Ultimately, after extensive hearings and deliberation, the court upheld the jury's verdict, acknowledging the peculiarity of the case. There is no documentation of a motion that might have sought to interrogate Howard about Linda's final resting place.
the analyst pointed out that such inquiries could have been integral to the defendant's sentencing. Her children were deprived of the opportunity to mourn their mother properly and give her a dignified farewell. Instead, they are left grappling with the uncertainty surrounding her last moments and the location of her remains. Perhaps one day, a discovery will be made that allows them to finally bring their mother home. The narrative centers around a quaint town in Indiana known as Kokomo. This community is regarded as an enjoyable place for families, celebrated for its low crime rates. However, the city, often referred to as the City of Firsts, bears a somber chapter in its history that deeply affected its residents. Destiny Renee Pittman was born on January 9, 1992, in Kokomo, to Melvin L. Douglas Jr. and Carla A. Pittman McCombs. She was the eldest of five siblings and cherished by many friends. Her radiant smile and vibrant personality made her a beloved figure, capable of illuminating any gathering. Destiny had aspirations in modeling and was eager to embark on her career. Just eight months prior to her tragic passing, she purchased a home where she lived with her boyfriend and a roommate, who had two children and three dogs, a chihuahua and two pit bulls. At 9.33 p.m. on February 7, 2013, the Kokomo police received an urgent call regarding a shooting at 815 James Drive. Officers were dispatched promptly, and upon their arrival at 9.40 p.m., they discovered a bullet hole in the wall and the lifeless body of 21-year-old Destiny Pittman in a pool of blood. She was declared dead at the scene. What renders this case particularly shocking is that all occupants of the house, including the dogs, were present when two assailants entered and fatally shot a young woman with a promising future. The intruders not only took her life but also stole cash and drugs before fleeing without leaving any clues. In a town like Kokomo, known for its safety, the presence of such ruthless criminals was alarming. An autopsy revealed that Destiny died from a single gunshot wound to the chest, which penetrated her body and struck the wall behind her. A 40 caliber shell casing was recovered from the scene. Subsequently, police interviewed Destiny's boyfriend and roommate to piece together the events of that night. They recounted that a loud banging on the door had alerted everyone in the house. The tranquility of the home was shattered as the door was forcefully breached, allowing two masked intruders to storm inside. Unaware of the peril that loomed, Destiny stood her ground, only to be met with a hail of gunfire that disregarded her very existence. The chaos echoed through the halls, prompting the inhabitants to seek refuge in the shadows. Destiny's roommate and boyfriend, paralyzed by fear, could only glimpse the sole shoe of one assailant as they scoured the premises. Frustration erupted from one of the robbers who bellowed, Where the hell is it? Moments later, they fled the scene, disappearing into a vehicle that remained unseen. On that fateful day, February 7, 2013, Destiny's aspirations were irrevocably shattered. Her roommate speculated that the intruders were African-American, a conclusion drawn from the urban inflections in their voices, though she later conceded that other possibilities existed. Destiny's boyfriend revealed to the authorities that both he and Destiny had been involved in the sale of marijuana, although she had distanced herself from the operation after coming into an inheritance. He disclosed that just days prior to the invasion, he had transported a stash of marijuana and over $2,000 to another location. The police surmised that the intruders may have been targeting the couple's illicit gains. Unfortunately, beyond this theory, the investigation yielded little in the way of leads. As two years slipped by, it was now 2015, and the only progress made was the cooperation of Destiny's roommate and boyfriend with the detectives who remained resolute in their pursuit of justice. The Pittman family mourned the loss of Destiny, their grief deepening with each passing month and year, while her home remained a shrine to her memory, untouched since that tragic day.
Carla Pittman McCombs, her mother, preserved the space as it was, stating, The bullet hole remains, along with all her photographs. The only thing I attempted was to clean the blood from the bedroom floor. The profound loss of her daughter left Carla's family in a state of despair, with her mother enveloped in sorrow and deep depression. Carla yearned for someone to acknowledge the tragedy of her daughter's passing. In a heartfelt statement to the media, she expressed, My existence has been utterly shattered. They took my child without cause. Whoever is responsible, I hope they find some semblance of satisfaction in their actions. They gained nothing from this. My happiness has been obliterated, casting a shadow over every aspect of my life. It has essentially dismantled my world. Steve McCombs, Destiny's stepfather, observed that Carla was struggling immensely with her daughter's death. Even after considerable time had passed, she would still invite visitors into their home, often remarking, This is Destiny's house, or You are in Destiny's home. Destiny's father, Douglas Jr., lamented, Each day is a challenge. My confidence is waning. It's disheartening. I understand the police are limited in what they can disclose, since the case remains under investigation. I simply miss her. He held on to the hope that those responsible would eventually come forward and confess, believing that one day they too would have children and would never wish harm upon them, thus comprehending the anguish they had caused. An anonymous relative echoed the sentiments of many, stating, Her heart will never beat again. Justice may never be fully served, but the family deserves closure. The perpetrator is devoid of compassion. It is utterly ruthless. Captain Teresa Galloway of the Kokomo Police Department issued a statement, affirming, This remains an active investigation. We have not classified it as a cold case. We continue to receive and follow up on tips. We urge anyone with information to step forward. Yet no one did. As hope dwindled in 2021, the Kokomo police reignited their appeal for information regarding Destiny's homicide, reiterating that the case was still open and that they had been diligently pursuing all leads and tips gathered over the past eight years. They earnestly appealed to the community, urging, If you possess any information, please come forward. Yet silence lingered. Then a significant development ignited the Kokomo Police Department's interest. On December 5, 2022, a voicemail arrived, a woman reaching out to the detective. She expressed her belief that the case could have been resolved differently, but as time passed without progress, she felt compelled to disclose information she had guarded for years. After witnessing numerous press releases about the case, she could no longer contain the truth. She was aware of the identity of Destiny's killer. The two individuals who intruded upon the residence that fateful night in Tumai 13 were 36-year-old Jesse McCartney and 32-year-old Joey McCartney. The informant confessed her fear of Jesse McCartney. When contacted by the police, she recounted her presence with the McCartney brothers that evening. They had claimed they were running an errand, and she decided to accompany them. While waiting in the jeep outside Destiny's home, she heard a deafening noise. Moments later, Jesse emerged from the house, clutching a gallon-sized bag of marijuana and a substantial amount of cash, closely followed by Joey. Jesse, the gun's owner, appeared visibly agitated as he entered the jeep. She further informed the police that the brothers had disposed of both the firearm and the jeep within six months of that night. The following day, Jesse invited the informant to accompany him as he drove her past Destiny's residence, pointing out the police tape that surrounded the area. To validate her account, the police requested that she identify the house in question, which indeed turned out to be Destiny's home on James Drive. She later disclosed to the authorities that Jesse had changed his phone number but still resided in Kokomo on Monroe Street, while his brother Joey had relocated to Kentucky. Subsequently, the police revisited Destiny's boyfriend, inquiring whether she had her own supply of drugs. 
He confirmed this, stating that it would have been present in the house during the home invasion. As the detective presented the photographs of Jesse and Joey McCartney, Destiny's boyfriend recognized Joey immediately. He remarked that Joey seemed familiar, likely having encountered him at their residence through a mutual acquaintance. After a decade of relentless investigation and numerous public tips, the detectives had amassed sufficient evidence. The moment for justice had arrived. An official announcement declared, Investigators from the Criminal Investigation Section have successfully secured arrest warrants for two individuals. At approximately 6 a.m. on March 2, 2023, Joey was apprehended by the U.S. Marshals and local law enforcement at a residence in Graham, Kentucky. Nearly two hours later, Jesse was taken into custody at his home in Kokomo. The McCartney brothers faced serious charges, including robbery resulting in bodily injury, conspiracy to commit burglary leading to bodily harm, and murder, all classified as Class A felonies, alongside a Class B felony charge of burglary. According to police reports, Indiana court records revealed that a resident of Kokomo identified Joey, recalling a misdemeanor battery charge he had faced in September 2012. A pretrial diversion agreement was filed on February 28, 2013, but the anticipated bench trial was ultimately cancelled. By March 2014, Joey had successfully completed his diversion program, leading to the dismissal of the case. Conversely, Jesse McCartney's name also appeared in the police database, as he too faced a battery charge in September 2012. The victim, a healthcare provider, sustained injuries, prompting the charge to be elevated to a felony. A pretrial diversion agreement was filed on April 3, 2013, and within a year the case was dismissed, with the file subsequently destroyed in 2016. Following their arrests, Jesse and Joey attended their initial hearings on March 9th and 10th, 2023, respectively. Both entered pleas of not guilty. However, the judge mandated that they be held without bond, with Jesse awaiting trial. The McCartney brothers, showing a complete disregard for the life of a young woman, who was just beginning her journey, took her life. After ten years shrouded in mystery, they are now poised to face justice for their actions.